With us now with more perspective on all this is former Green Beret David Dizzo and Iranian-American analyst Holly Dagras, a fellow with the Atlantic Council. Thank you both so much for being here. Okay, let's start with a big question. Who did it? Iran's supreme leader is blaming Israel, but David, this does not fit the pattern of Israeli strikes, which are usually surgical and quite precise, not the mass murder of civilians. Great to be with you, Elizabeth. Yeah, it's, it's definitely out of norm, right? So the only people that really have a history of killing mass civilians like this are terrorist groups, not nation states. And so Israel, while allegedly has conducted operations inside of Iran, uh, those allegations were also very specific and targeted, like you said. So precise uh, takedowns versus just massive civilians killing. Uh, so it does, doesn't look like an Israeli or U.S. connection there. Uh, Holly, Israel has targeted Iran before. Just last week, former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett confirmed he ordered strikes in Iran in 2022. Well, when we're talking about strikes, we're talking about strikes against Iranian officials, people that are tied to its nuclear or ballistic missile programs. So they're focused on Iranian officials, and um, arguably Mossad's playground is Iran these days. But I would say with certainty and without a doubt that Israel had nothing to do with this attack. So, Holly, we know that Iran and ISIS are enemies. Could this attack be the work of ISIS or a separatist group already inside Iran? Um, well, um, there's... Well, a lot of reason to believe that ISIS or one of its affiliates like ISIS in Afghanistan, which is very close to the um, Kermon, the city in southeast Iran is actually closer to Afghanistan and Pakistan. So it would lead, um, there would be a lot of reason to believe that ISIS may have been behind the attack. But I think it's quite odd that we have yet to hear that they've claimed responsibility. Um, ISIS has claimed um, responsibility for attacks in the past. There were two incidents in Shiraz at a holy mosque called the Shah Chirag Mosque in both 2022 and 2023. And there was also an attack on a military parade in Ahwaz in 2018, and they've claimed responsibility for that. Um, I think it's also noteworthy to say that um, some Iranians on the ground are actually blaming the clerical establishment for this incident. So it's something to consider as well. Why? What would the clerical, clerical establishment want to gain by doing this? Well, I'm, I, um, this is not my theory, I should add. This is what I've been reading on social media. Iranians believe that maybe this was a distraction from the events in the region, and they, they think that maybe perhaps this was to gain more solidarity with the regime at a time when there's um, uh, their support is at an all-time low for the past few years, and especially in the light of um, the ongoing war in the region. David, Iran is vowing retaliation. What might that look like, especially given the uncertainty of who's behind it? It's odd they're vowing retaliation when nobody's claimed credit and there's been no investigation thus far. It just happened. Right. I think they have to have a, a strong response like that, vowing a lot of rhetoric that they've done in the past. If we look back to when Soleimani was killed in the drone strike, they they had a lot of strong rhetoric then, and they had very few global actions or uh, uh, retaliations since then. So they do have a global network of proxies. They, we do know they typically are attacking or seeking to attack sites of significance, embassies, places where is Israelis and U.S. move throughout the bases all over the Middle East. Uh, but I, it's really interesting, though, to see the, the political tightrope that everybody's walking, right? So if, if they come out and identify who they think did this, then they have to have a global response uh, very soon or very fast. And I think what you see with Iran and what you've seen with Hezbollah is they, they're very careful with their, their, what they, their statements are, and they don't specify a timeline for actions. And that gives them right. a little bit of an advantage to figure it out and to kind of make, uh, to take an action that's on their terms, which gives them the most uh, opportunity. Meantime, uh, you know, this all happens one day after this attack in Lebanon, which killed a very senior member of Hamas. Israel is neither confirming nor denying its involvement uh, in that strike. But the leader of Israel's Mossad gave a stern warning today to Hamas. I want you to listen. It'll take time as it took time after the Munich massacre, but we will put our hands on them wherever they are. Every Arab mother should know that if her son participated directly or indirectly in the massacre of October 7th, he will bear responsibility. 
David, we all know that Mossad uh, agents took their time, as, as, the, as the head of Mossad said, uh, after the Munich attacks to exact their revenge. Um, any chance that this warning today is going to change? We keep seeing images of Hamas leaders at the Four Seasons, and maybe it's a different hotel by now in Qatar, you know, on the treadmill, ordering room service, hanging out by the pool. Are these guys feeling safe after listening to that warning today? Uh, I don't think they're feeling safe. I don't. I think the warning is the same message that everyone recognizes, and and everyone knows whether it's Iran or Israel, they will come back, and they do take their time with actions and retaliations. Uh, I would not. Uh, looking back at the Munich massacre, it took several years, and they were very patient, and they committed resources to to exacting uh, revenge. And so I think what you'll see is there that, and I think it'll take a long time to type to take the leadership out and anyone who had anything to do with it, but I, I believe their commitment's real. Yeah. Uh, Holly, in the meantime, there's an Iranian warship in the Red Sea now, very close to U.S. warships that are already there patrolling. The entire region is a tinderbox, and today the United States, Britain, and several other key allies, a total of 12 countries, issued a warning to the Houthis to stop its attacks in the Red Sea or, quote, bear the consequences. What will those consequences be? It's really hard to say, given the, the dynamics in the region at play. I, I, I really worry that the one wrong move will lead to an all-out regional war, and that's really one of the big concerns we're seeing right now. And this is why there's been calls for de-escalation in the region from the West, so it makes sense that this is the direction we're going. David, how dangerous is it now to have these warships bumping up against each other, not literally but figuratively, in this region? Well, just... Remember, in, in, in the, there's an entire American strike group that is far more capable than this Iranian naval vessel. Uh, while the Houthis have increased attacks, they're, they're hitting soft targets. So if you hit a container ship, you have one gun, you could probably take the entire container ship because it's just four or five people. It's very few people on the thing. So they're hitting soft targets. They're not actually devastating anything. And now the U.S. forces and the Navy and then a number of countries have come together uh, to defend against that, basically warning the Houthis that if they try to in, uh, disrupt trade, uh, there will be consequences. And I think that just means that they'll strike back when they when they do target these naval vessels. Yeah, it's worth pointing out that 15 percent of the global trade passes through this region, through this waterway. So it's important and it has a huge impact uh, regardless. Um, I'm curious, um, Holly, I, we know that the uh, Hamas leader who was assassinated in Lebanon yesterday had been in Iran in November um, trying to co in get Iran to be more involved in the war uh, that Hamas is waging against Israel. He did not get the support that he wanted from Iran. But we also know that he was involved very directly in all negotiations between Hamas and Israel to release the hostages. Um, now that he's dead, what happens to those negotiations? We heard, I heard Hamas uh, pulled out of all negotiations. Does this mean they're dead now, these negotiations, or were they not even going anywhere? Um, well, we're three months into the war, and so... It's it's becoming a very complicated the negotiations process, and I, I think that the assassination will complicate matters. But given that the war is ongoing and Hamas would like a ceasefire, that they're going to have to negotiate some way out of it for a ceasefire, and uh, maybe this might um, push back negotiations. But I think they're eventually they'll get back on the same page to end this war, at least in Hamas's view, presumably. All right. Things couldn't, if we thought things were tense, it feels like every single day something happens again to ratchet up the tension uh, in, a, in a region of the world that's already on pins and hooks. All right. David Dizo, Holly Douglas, thank you so much for being with us.